Research labs were, I think, much more, industrial research labs were much more kind of abundant uh, a few decades ago. And I think one trend has been that those have sort of uh, been downsized a lot over the years. And I think that a positive thing about that is, is that a lot of, as far as academic jobs, is that industry looks more to academia for research, I think. So from a research point of view, I think there is a very positive trend as, as you see constantly a need for more innovation and a lot of interest in, you know, better, more innovation and, and appreciation for research as, as things keep getting very competitive on a global scale. So I think from a research point of view, I see that as a very positive trend for, for academic jobs. But I, I think uh, Pamela raised some very good concerns on the uh, educational side that were, uh, with, you know, with uh, the advent of all these online courses, there is, uh, you know, a, big, uh, a lot of new things to, to think about there. And a lot of some uncertainty there, uh, and 
that's something that I'm not really completely up to date on, but uh, that's something I, uh, I see that it's just that, that that's happening. Okay. Um, um, let me uh, disagree with a bit with what you say in a positive way. Um, I would say, regardless of the economy, regardless of whatever happens, there's always going to be openings in academia. That's for sure. Okay. That's one of the most stable kind of job market uh, over the years that you can count on. However, there are good years and bad years. Um, like for the last five or six years, we see about three or four really, really bad years. And then we see like two or three very, very good years. And there's always this up and down. Um, and, but on average, there's always openings because uh, in people in academia always retire and then new, new positions open opens and they wanna uh, replace that uh, by new blood and, and, and new ideas. Uh, so, the prediction for the next two or five years in terms of the trends in the job market, um, I think I think academia are driven by big challenges, um, <clears throat> both in economy and, and, and in intellectual challenges. Uh, if, if we look at if we if we look at the history a little bit, over the last two or three years, what has become very popular? Um, energy, right? Um, uh, the, you know, renewable energy, smart grid, uh, and also cybersecurity. Big data, you know. If you if you think about what is what are the the the, 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 the motivations and, and the factors that, that actually play a role in terms of getting academia to pay attention to this field is in these fields there are innovations that's coming, okay, already happen. Big data, social network, right, and you know smart grid because renewable energy is dominating and people want to build a better uh, power grid, uh, and also. Uh, uh, separate securities because for very obvious reasons, right? You know, like so, 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 uh, and because of these challenges, there are a lot of resources, both from the society, uh, from the government, and from the industry, are pouring into these places. And and academia people in academia, we want to tap in these resources to develop our, our research program to, to 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 develop you know next generation new new ideas, new research, right? And that even though we have our freedom, but our freedoms. Are often tied in with these kind of grand challenges. Right? Nobody wants to sit in your room just think about things that are relevant. Right? So you have to be relevant. Uh, so, so I would say if you want me to make a prediction for the next two or five years, uh, it, that's equivalent to, uh, to ask me to predict what's going to happen, uh, what breakthrough or innovation is going to happen in the next two or five years. I think the market is a better position to do that. Uh, <laughs> um, but the thing is, pay attention to the trends. And pay attention to what's going on now, uh, and, and 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 open your eyes, listen to the news, listen to what what are the things that people are talking about right now. What are the what are the fashion? What are the trends? And also a good place uh, for information is these these kind of internet. You can search for job openings. Keep track of the job openings over the last five or six years. It will kind of show you the shift of the trend. Um, I have to do that because uh, I have have to advise students to look for faculty jobs and and. and you know, so 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 uh, I habitually just just go uh, get the I should be spectral magazine. I habitually just go to the back pages and, and, and take a quick look, right? Even though it's kind of boring, but you know, it's sort of you know what are the keywords out there. Okay, um, and immediately prospects for next year, uh, which I already said, you know, just this is the challenges that that's very hard right now. Right? But then but then you know, I mean, system control and robotics, right? Like, what if you're you're not in this keyword? Like, like you you you're, you're doing like, at my time when I was applying, I was a kind of theoretical control guy, and, and none of the things that that's popular over there that I was working on, I was panic because because I feel like people don't want me, um, and, and 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 because I was my research nothing related to obvious things. Okay, so how can I find a job? And I, I it, but magically I, I I end up having a job. So so the the reason being. Even though a lot of the, the positions announces this cool thing, but they still want the good person. They still want the best person they can find. So suppose you're not doing the things that's very hot and very fast, and very good, but, but you have very high quality work and you show intellectual strengths and, and, and you show them the potential that you are able to take on any challenges you can have for the future, then you still have a chance. Okay, so it's not absolute. Good. That's all.
Okay, so being a new faculty, I don't have too much to contribute to, I think, this, this one particular topic. But I think to build on what you said, you should look at job postings, especially if you want to get ahead. Like, so maybe you're two or three years away from graduation, you do want to look at the job postings and see what people are really interested in. And then try to build your resume towards certain areas that you're interested in. I think that that's a, a fantastic idea. Um, I agree with most of what Simon said. Um, it, it was a very bad situation for a while, particularly at state universities, but things have gotten much better. There are jobs out there, um, and I think there will always be jobs. I mean, you, you mentioned the, uh, the faculty will always be retiring, and that's true. I mean, there is not a mandatory retirement age, but there was enormous amounts of hiring at various periods of time. Um, one of the consequences is that there are large numbers of faculty in their 60s and 70s in ECU departments. And so at some point, these people are going to be retired. Um, so that's, you know, from your point of view, a positive development. <laughs> they will need new blood. Um, there are a lot of ups and downs, and one of the fact that there are a lot of ups and downs from year to year, if you look within a specific research area, there's even more ups and downs. Sometimes they're not looking for anybody. Sometimes they are looking for people. Which, is, I mean, we'll talk about this later, but this is one of the reasons I advise people to apply both for postdocs and for faculty. Because if you're, say, in a theoretical area and you can get a faculty position, you might want to go for it because there may not be any. Or very few next year. Um, another thing I would say is um, we'll talk more about the search, but uh, there are more openings if you look more broadly. So if you only look at ECE jobs, there's a certain universe. Okay? But you know, depending on what area you are in, it may well overlap what's done in other departments. If you're on the sort of physical electronics side of the department, <coughs> perhaps there are a job in physics may be um, uh, something you could apply for as well. I mean, some of our faculty in this department have their degrees in physics and have joint appointments in physics. Um, my last two PhD students who got faculty positions, one's in an industrial engineering department and one's in an department of applied math and statistics because the kinds of things they did overlap what these departments do. There are departments of systems, for example, at the University of Virginia, that somebody who's doing control might apply to. Um, so I would keep that in mind. There, um, and I know that area better, but you know, a lot of the top people doing control in mechanical engineering departments have degrees in that happens a lot. And just keep your eyes open for what might be going on in other fields. And that will sort of help smooth out the ups and downs and give you a broader pool of departments. We need a new dean of business. And one previous dean was also a dean of business. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, there were more. At one point, more members of the National Academy of Engineering at the Business School. Uh, <laughs> right. So, um, an AE degree can go in all sorts of directions. And in fact, when Anne Rougeau, who's now at Georgia Tech in Industrial Engineering, applied for jobs, she applied to ECE departments, industrial engineering departments, and operations research groups in business schools. Because the kinds of things that we do have people in all those different places doing them. And I would be very broad in thinking about where you might possibly end up. Yeah, um, I guess getting towards the, the end of the table here, I probably don't have quite as much to say anymore. Um, but yeah, so I, I, maybe I'll, I'll follow up on uh, the, the last comment. Um, so myself, I'm uh, a physics undergrad, physics grad school, um, and I'm in, in an ECE department. Um, so again, there is a lot of interplay between these different fields. And so when I was looking at um, for jobs, I was looking in uh, like IEEE and I was also looking in Physics Today, so I was looking at kind of both uh, realms.
problems. And so when I was applying, I was applying to UTE and physics and even to material science and things like that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that is kind of broad. So yeah, you definitely should look um, at, in different different departments as well. Um, one thing I guess maybe think about a little bit when you're doing that is what kind of teaching you would be doing in those different departments. Because as you start to step out into um, areas that you're less familiar with, then there may be even fewer classes that you're able to teach in those types of departments. So that's something to think about a little bit. Um, the other comment, I guess, about the, the uh, cyclic nature of, of jobs um, and, and the hiring. Um, so, like, for instance, here, I guess last year we had two or three openings in cyber security. Um, and so, like, that's kind of what they were, there, there was, like, one or two things that they were heavily recruiting for. And maybe a year or two before that, they were looking for something else that was very different. So every couple of years, there are these waves. And so um, depending on what year it is, um, they may or may not be looking for something that you're, you're doing. So it's good to keep an eye out on those, those things and trends um, as, as time goes on. And as you start getting close, if you see something that looks interesting and, and would be appealing to you, you might want to jump at it now because two years from now, they might not be having those, those same sort of things. Well, uh, I certainly am not going to pretend to know what the job market's going to be like in uh, two to five years on the... Uh, what's 2018. What's that? <laughs> um, and I mean, yeah, there, there certainly is plenty to uh, be, be weary about coming out of D.C. Um, and that, that certainly trickles down to, to available jobs. But um, so, so what I did, I went uh, overseas for a bit. So in between my Ph.D. and coming here, I spent a year in uh, Sweden and a couple years in Australia. Uh, not because the job market was particularly bad at the time, I just hadn't lived outside the U.S. and thought I should before taking what uh, is you know, hopefully a, a permanent job. Uh, but, I mean, the point is that you know, this is a, a long-term job, so you try not to be swayed too much by the you know, short-term uh, flips. Or, you, know, you don't want to be subject to the, the whims of people in uh, DC at the end of the day. And, I mean, I try you know, really hard not to be swayed too much by what uh, what is or isn't fashionable. But I mean, even if you do want to be subject to the to what's trendy in the sense of you know looking at certain applications, you definitely don't want to be, and, and that's debatable. But what's hopefully not is that you really don't want to be thinking about these short-term things when you're thinking about do I want to be a faculty member or not, because that's something for that you'll have for, for many decades if you go through it, or at least you could. Um, and so hopefully that it's a two to five year question. Uh, we probably already spent more time on it than we should. Yeah, the last week a good comment. Uh, I, I hear a lot of gloom out there concerning the fact that there are not many faculty positions around and it's hard, hard to get positions. Uh, I, I would not. Uh, in my opinion, the situation is not as gloomy as many people say it is. In fact, I, I'm not sure if it is not. It is. I'm not sure it is worse now than 20, 30 years ago. 30 years ago, there were typically maybe 50 applicants for one position, and those 50 applicants, by the way, also applied to, to 15 other positions. Each of those applicants. That that meant roughly one position for three applicants. Nowadays, we have 200 people applying for, for one position, but each of them applied for 60 positions. So we still have just about the same ratio. It looks worse because we are told, okay, 200 applicants, what chances are, do I have? Well, many of these applicants will get positions yeah. elsewhere, they are not competing with you. In fact, in my, in my recollection, from what I can, I can think of, of all the applicants in recent years I have known from this department applying to faculty position. I think probably about one out of two now has a faculty position. So the ratio is more one out of two than one out of 20 or 30. So I don't think it's bad at all. Along the same line, have any of you guys looked into international universities and possibly working in other countries? I can comment. I can comment on China uh, because I have some connection there. I, I have a lot of friends there. I visit them. Uh, in China, the academic market is booming, no doubt about it. It has been booming for uh, five, at least five years. I know. Uh, so, and and they are 
they are trying to hire a lot of people graduating from here with PhD degree, and most most out there preferably back to to teach there. Uh, but on the other hand, the uh, initial job offer conditions has been kind of steady declining, meaning. Uh, like five or six years ago, or even ten years ago, you got a postdoc here. You go back; they might immediately give you like a equivalent of a tenure position. Uh, but now you go back; you have to kind of start from scratch, just like here. Um, and, and 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 you know, and, and I'm talking about really good universities. Uh, however, there there is strong need in China, uh, especially for Chinese citizens here to get to get because you have the language, no have no, no language problem, etc. So. So, so, so I, I, I want to suggest people here to consider that um, because oftentimes I feel like Chinese citizens here um, kind of wants to, if you're really good, you kind of want to be here for a while, right, before you go back and all that. If you don't speak Chinese, you can still be hiring China, and, and, and a lot, I know a lot of good places actually prefer that because they, they have this weird political kind of uh, system to say if you're able to hire non Chinese speaking faculty members be there, it counted more towards the, the the kind of achievements of the department and all that. It boosts your reputation, right? And all that. So you offer students different experience because you're fluent in English, you can teach them. So I would say Chinese academic market is booming. And if you graduate from here, you definitely have an edge. Uh, so so consider that. So I have a question for you. My what I have heard is that the conditions for an assistant professor in an ACE department in China are not nearly as good as they are for an assistant professor in an ACE department here in terms of salary, in terms of being able to supervise PhD students, all these kinds of things. I just wanted to comment on that. Right. Um, the, one of the biggest <coughs> problems, I feel, uh, is in China it used to be like you, as assistant professor, cannot uh, advise PhD student. You have to partner with some guy senior um, because because this is in China. PhD advisor is an academic title, even higher than professor. You can be a full professor, but you, you still don't have the right to advise PhD student. I think that's learned from the Russian system as well, or something. Like that. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. <laughs> Blame the Russians, right? So, so. <laughs> but 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 but. This has been a problem, and you know, people have been complaining about it. Now, in good places, in very good universities, they start to allow the freedom. Oh, it's getting that, better. Okay. It's getting better now. Um, and I know, like in Tsinghua University and Zhejiang University, probably already kind of, or Shanghai Zhou University, probably wants to copy the system here. Mm -hmm. um, so that's definitely changing. The wind is changing. Yeah. I have a lot of collaborators in Europe, so I'm kind of different countries with the system courses and so on. But, uh, but I think Europe is, can be also very attractive for postdoc positions. They seem to have a lot of support for postdoc positions, and those positions look very interesting. And uh, from uh, faculty, and especially in my area, there are certain areas, I think, where also research support is exceptionally good. My, uh, my area is embedded systems, so traditionally, Europe has been very strong in that area with very good cooperation between industry and uh, universities and research. Uh, so, uh, one, but, but the Europe, I think, my understanding is for where you actually get actual fac faculty positions there, like a junior faculty, it's kind of like what you were describing, that you actually enter and you're kind of, you, it's like a supervisory relationship with senior professors there, so it's a little bit different there, I think, entering as a junior faculty. But still, that can be a good path. But I know at least definitely for postdoc positions, very much worth considering. So I'll just end, end out this question. Uh, section maybe by, by making a few comments. In, in my field, I have quite a few international collaborators who you know, have found faculty jobs in international sets, like Hong Kong or, or, or other places. And I think that the, the specific expectations of faculty jobs and faculty promotion vary a lot from country to country, and it would be helpful for you to talk to your advisor to know what the openings are internationally, but also to begin to understand what some of those expectations and the, the kind of the, the understanding of that system before you go into it um, are, is like. Um, and the, the other thing that I'll just finally mention and pass to Andre is that um, 
The funding situation internationally is also very, very different from what we experience here in the U.S. Um, I, you know, when I speak to my international colleagues in meetings, um, many of them are actually quite happy with their national funding arrangements. Um, and it's a very different situation to that kind of free-for-all, open market philosophy that we seem to have in the United States regarding funding. Um, and so um, understanding not just the kind of expectations and the, and the hierarchy of the faculty um, uh, career ladder, but also the funding prospects and expectations is um, likely, is, is, is very important for you to understand as you think about those positions. Uh, concerning Europe and university, it's not everywhere the case, and it is changing. So the, the idea of hierarchy, a big professor at the top, and then people will report to him, that is changing a lot. And in fact, the, the, the two universities I know best, uh, Louvain and Liège in Belgium, are, are not like that at all. So it's very much like here. Uh, something, the main difference, I would say, is that, and that's changing too, used to be, uh, in Belgium, but I think it's pretty much throughout Europe, that a professor is attached to a set of courses. In fact, when they hire, they hire somebody to teach those courses. And so the system is very much frozen. You always teach the, the same courses. You own those courses. You are proud to having those. Sometimes you, have, you ask one of your TAs to teach one of them, and it's fine. Uh, so, so the, but that's changing too. But, but this, the idea of having a right hierarchy, that, that is changing a lot, and in many cases, we're not having it. So I'll take the prerogative as the moderator to ask my colleagues one final question before we move on to discuss the application process. Um, I think a number of people made the comment as we went through that there is this cyclic nature of an academic job market. Some years, you know, this department hires six people. Some years, we hire zero people. It's just, that's just life. You have these cycles. The academic job market lags the economic industrial picture by some years. And, and you experience these cycles. But you, as a PhD student who's graduating and thinking about how am I going to eat next year, um, <laughs> what, does, what does that mean for you? So um, maybe we could just kind of quickly go through and if anyone has practical advice for, for, for what you think are the best options for bridging that academic job cycle to actually, if you really care about finding a faculty position. Anybody? Yeah, uh, I, would, I would say this. Um, stick on, uh, hold on. You know, uh, one year, two year, wait for it. Um, wait for a good year. So uh, you, uh, the advice I always give my students is don't apply for faculty job unless you really, 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 really want it. Okay, and, and, if, and, and, and if you really, 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 really want it, you're going to get it. Um, and the process is designed to be uh, unfun unfriendly, uncomfortable, um, turn you away, kind of don't care kind of thing, uh, discourage you because they want the fittest. Um, so the one who survived at last will win. That, that, that's always my advice. So, <laughs> um, so uh, another thing, if, um, after you graduate, if you're looking at a postdoc, this is a good opportunity too, right? Because this is another job that it's kind of a temporary job. You're looking at maybe one to three years, something like that, where you're doing another kind of project. Uh, but you also you have some flexibility because it is it's kind of a year to year thing, but it's typically going to be one to three years. So if something comes up in the first year or the second year and you want to take a faculty position, you can do that. Um, so that's kind of a, a good kind of cushion area as well where you're getting some more experience and skills, meeting other people, which is also good networking. But at the same time, if something comes up, you can take take a position. Yeah, in that sense, there's a big difference between if you can get a two-year postdoc as opposed to a one. If you get a one, I mean, the second you arrive, you're starting to think about your job applications. Um, whereas, you know, if you have two or two or three years, then, you know, you can at least actually, you know, focus on the research first before trying to kind of blend the two together and keep an eye out and everything that everybody's been recommending. You, you don't have those options if, if you have a one-year job. And another possibility is hanging around here for another year if your advisor or somebody else is amenable to that. So. Um, you know, it often happens that an advisor will hire a postdoc for a while and help both the advisor and the student be more productive, especially and help the student and give the student time to just go through the cycle that we're talking about. Do you have any questions? Yeah. Um, 
Thanks, all for a gracious evening. Um, my question is about learning the international map. Um, if you did do a personal map or say you did a job somewhere else, would that look worse, maybe, to most professors? Or, uh, or departments can you refund that? And also about uh, money, because I know I've heard in places, uh, UAE, Qatar, other places, other countries are paying two or three times the salary of Americans to try to get Americans there. Um, I'm sure I've seen salaries in Europe as lower because of healthcare and all those other things. So I have those two issues. I think what's important is that you work with somebody who is a recognized figure in the field, and it absolutely doesn't matter where that person is. That's that's my view. I mean, if it's you know some star in at High in Missouri, um, everybody in the United States in the field knows that person. But if you're thinking about going to um, a kind of developing country that is putting a lot of money into postdocs, and you'll be working with someone that people in this country don't know, then that's going to make it better. Yeah, but there are some dangers that, that you hinted at. Um, so, for instance, I, I could have had my position in Australia for another four years, um, which you know was kind of a beautiful thing, but I saw what was happening with some more senior people who were then trying to get jobs in the U.S. and I mean, very good people who then, you know, for years couldn't find um, jobs who were looking to, to be hired at least at an associate professor level. Um, so once I saw how nearly impossible it is to, to come over if you've been overseas for too long, you know, I, I thought it was a better idea to come back while I was still willing to take a job at the assistant professor uh, level. Um, I also tried to. to travel and give lots of talks. Um, so whenever I was in the States with some family or, or for a conference or whatever, I'd visit a couple of universities, give seminars on what I was doing. So as long as you can do, do things like that, you can you know, overcome whatever bias someone might have if they're not as familiar with the, with the institution or the amount of people who, uh, who, who know what you're doing. But, but you're, not, you're not wrong to have some, some fears there, but they, they can be dealt with. Are there any more questions on the, the academic job market? Okay, I'll shift us, segue us into the, the portion of our uh, discussion about the application process. Um, the application process covering um, which schools to look for, what are the deadlines, how to prepare res you know, preparing a resume, research and teaching statements, the interview process, research talk, maybe sometimes teaching talk, um, the transition between a PhD, pro PhD thesis and joining a position, and um, a backup plan. Um, so um, maybe we can focus more on kind of the initial stage, since that's the kind of the academic um, cycle that we're entering into now. Um, maybe maybe kind of particularly relevant for anyone who's thinking about being in that market this year. So let's kind of focus on the, the first chunk of that, which is the identifying schools, what are the deadlines, how do you start putting your packet together? So how about the school? How do you start? Okay. Work towards and, and, and how do you look at it? Yeah, in, in terms of, of, of tailoring your resume, maybe for the last few years of your graduate school, right? There are some people I'm hoping in the room who are thinking about putting themselves into that cycle this year, but I'm hoping there are also people in the room, and I'm looking at some of my students who are thinking about putting themselves into that cycle in a year or two when they're ready for it, and there are things that they can do now to start getting ready for it. So maybe you could go back the other way. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, 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 um, question: What what does it take to, to land a faculty position? What what counts? What does not count? So I, I hear people saying you, you need to have at least five papers, at least ten papers, one of papers. Uh, need, need to have had a fellowship or something. Uh, I think this is uh, important to some extent at the first selection level when, when 20, 200 appli applications have been received and if you sit through that, well, if you see 20 papers, okay, then let's keep it and have a second look at that. Uh, but it, it's not what's going to land you a position. Possibly, possibly you get an interview out of that. Uh, but uh, unless you are very good, you will not get the position. So, so in my opinion, the, the, the important things to, 
get a, a position. One is, is what school you are from, the name of the school, and I think here you, you have a reasonably good position for that. Second, but even more important, to your advisors. I think Steve mentioned that uh, concerning uh, uh, to post on publish. Like the advice, the name of the advisor, this is the important how they can how they can add the, the, the advisor. Um, uh, and, and and then very important next one is quality of work you have here. And again, you don't need to have many papers out. Uh, one, 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 one of the faculty member in this department, Dr. La, many of you know him, keeps reminding me or, and, and asks that in fact, when he was hired, he didn't have single journal paper. He had a couple of conferences. But he was coming from, from, from Berkeley and from a very well-known advisor, who, <coughs> of course, is not in the other two advisors who are very well-known, but the advisor should think of you very highly. What the advisor is going to tell other people on the phone, calling around to people at the places where they may be hiring, or writing reference letters, that, that counts a lot. How, how well the advisor think about you, how well some other people who may be well recognized think about you. So letters of recommendation, not, not just letters, first phone calls. Okay? And, and meeting at, at conferences, the advisor meets people who say, okay, we're looking for somebody. Do you have any good student? Yes, I know this, uh, this student of mine is just about to graduate, or maybe only next year, so if you can wait a little bit, this guy is really tough. So, so, so uh, taking a, a good advisor and proving to your advisor that you are really tough, you're doing too tough quality work that may not involve publishing anything. Should have written something at least, right? And maybe presenting at conference. <laughs> By the way, the other thing is not only advisors should think, think highly of you, but other people should think highly of you. At least you need at least you need certain recommendation letters, but also beyond that, again at conferences, people talk to each other a lot, right? And so if somebody from some other school knows that you are very good, that counts even more. And then the advisor, of course, the advisor likes. Somebody from some other school. Now, if I tell you when you are here, you cannot go around and meet people, they will not meet with you. What should you do? Well, for one thing, you should try to, to convince your advisor to send you to, to conferences. And you can tell the advisor, well, the decision fee is very low over there, and I can fly southwest. <laughs> 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 Stay in the conference hotel, I can always stay in uh, uh, this little place nearby, okay, and I have friends in the city, I will not need any money to go. So it's not that hard of me to go to conferences. It's good, so even if you don't have a paper, going to conferences, you can, you can see if, uh, in the first step, see the people that you have heard about, okay, try to, to, to join the lunch parties, start chatting with people. Telling them about the, about your work, asking questions also in the talk, or right after the talk, you go to a speaker, asking uh, asking questions, tell people about your work. So at conferences, in, even without going to conferences, this department, among others, has lots of visitors, lots of very well known people come here, and quite often the visitor spends most of his much of his time with the host. Partly because uh, not many other people have expressed interest to meet with the visitor. Well, when you see that the visitor that, that you have know you know about this work and so on and so on, find out who the host is. Email to the host. I very much need, would like to meet the, the, the person. I don't need to be just by myself. Okay, if it's a group, it's fine. But I have a bad date about it. And, and Tell the person, again, express interest in their work first, I guess you don't know, just talk about your work, but uh, express interest, and then try to do some homework beforehand so that you can ask good questions about, about their work. And then tell them about your work, and then right after they leave, send them an email, thank you for, for meeting with me, and it was very interesting, and by the way, I mentioned to you this paper, where well, there's a link to that paper, yeah, and if you can comment on it, I'll be very happy. 
right? Well, the first first step is to do very good work. This doesn't help you to do uh, work known by others. It is not very good. The first step very good. <laughs> but very good work is not enough. You have to publicize. And now brother says that you have to publicize. So until the end of that, I was going to say I'll try to make this more actionable because you're not going to know until it's too late if your advisor is the kind of person who's going to pick up the phone for you or not. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, similar to what you were saying, when you, depending on what school you apply to, you'll need between three to five letters of recommendation. So it's really important to, as, as Andre was saying later, to, to make sure you'll have lots of several other people who, uh, who can do that as well. And while I don't yet have that much experience on the other side of the table looking at applicants, I know that anyone who's possibly going to be looking at it is extraordinarily busy, and they're probably going to first, you know, to, to make their job easier, look at who wrote these letters to see if there's anyone they know, anyone they've heard of, who can kind of siphon all this information quickly and see what they have to say in their one to three uh, page letter. So, yeah, it's, it's really important to, you know, give seminars, talk to visitors, uh, when you go to conferences, you know, again, hopefully your advisors that, you know, will, will recognize how important that is and try to introduce you to people and whatnot. But if they're not, you know, they, they probably just haven't thought of it. They're probably happy to. So, you know, take that extra step to, you know, say, you know, would you mind introducing me to so-and-so, uh, do dinner with, you know, because they know people from, from everywhere by now. And it's it, it looks really good if there are people who don't have a, uh, a stake in whether you get this job or not, uh, who are at other schools who are still saying great things about your work. Good. Um, yes, I, I, I would agree um, with all of those statements. It's really, it, I think it really is important to have um, people on your side that are talking to people that are out there in, in the job market. and so. If your advisor or you know, a collaborator or something is willing to talk to people that, you know, and, and say something about, you know, you're you know, you know, it's great to do in your postdoc, uh, it's looking for a job, I think those types of things help a lot because you do, you have like 200 applications, 300 applications, and there's a lot of really good people out there. Um, and so there needs to be something that's going to make them spend an extra minute looking at your application. And so if they have met you before, or they know your advisor, and your advisor said something about you, um, that will give them that extra minute or two, which is what you need. Um, so I think I think that those things are really important. Um, a lot; th those are also things that are hard to control. Um, so I guess you can take that either way. Um, maybe I'll, I'll mention a couple of these other things quickly. I guess that, that well, we started off with there's the identifying schools to apply to. Um, so uh, I, the way that I look at this is I look at the places where they have job postings. So whether it's you know IEEE or wherever, you can go online, they have job postings. And there are tons of jobs there. So you can do your job filters and look at places. Um, you can also, if there are certain schools that you're thinking about, go to their websites and the department websites there. Because sometimes, for some reason, they're not publicizing in quite the right spots that, that, um, that you think that they should be. And so you might miss something um, there. Or it might be that the funding. Uh, they weren't quite sure how the job was going to go, so they've, they're saying that they're starting to look for things, but they haven't actually posted anything. So it's good to check out the websites as well of the individual schools. Um, deadlines, you'll find out those kinds of things as you're looking at the application. They're usually kind of, you know, October, November, December, January, February. They kind of vary a lot depending on the school and the department and things like that, but anywhere basically from now to the beginning of, of the year. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll check off one more of these uh, resumes. Um, so, yeah, so usually you're looking at like a, a CV, so it's a, a longer thing that's like a one-page uh, resume or two-page resume. It's a longer thing. Uh, you can go to um, like people's websites a lot of times and see like people that are you know doing well that are maybe somewhat young or even older people as well, but they're going to be a little bit different probably the way the CVs are composed. But it's good to kind of take a look at what other ones look like and and see if you see you know, formats that you like. And you want it to also be something where you can look at it, it looks pleasant to the eyes, and you can kind of pick out what the major accomplishments are that you want um, them to, to see. Because again, it's one of those documents that you know, maybe starting off, it's only a couple pages long, but as you get you know, towards graduation or postdoc, it gets longer and longer. And so you might have you know, 10 pages or something, and 
Um, there's a lot of text, so you, you want to be able to quickly be able to see what are you know, your key highlights and accomplishments. Um, can you use LaTeX? I know people won't even look at it if it's made in Word. <laughs> I guess a lot of people will look at mine. So. <laughs> Some fields it's more accessible. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I'll say a few things, hopefully, to, to complement what's been said. The, the role of the advisor is critical. You want an advisor who will be an advocate. Um, in, in my experience, I teach the um, seminar on teaching in our future faculty program that some of you may have taken. Um, and so for those of you who want to be faculty and aren't in this program and want to be in it in the future, I would encourage you to apply for it. There's a lot of good stuff. One of the things I've noticed is some of the students have come to me as they're applying for faculty positions from across the college, not this department necessarily. And I've noticed a uh, disappointing lack of involvement by their advisor in their process. And um, I think, as, as Mike said, it could be that it's just not the way they're used to doing things. So don't be shy. Ask them for help. Um, I would ask them, I mean, so the way I do it with my students is none of my students sends in anything related to the faculty position unless I've seen it. I mean, I give them feedback on their CV, on their cover letter, on their research statement, on their teaching statement, and it's really important. I can't overestimate, I, I can't uh, overemphasize the importance of good writing. If you send in things that are not written well, this will be an excuse just to toss your application. Um, even if you have a bunch of papers. Maybe if you have 20, they'll still look at it. But uh, <laughs> even if you have a bunch of papers and journals and they read the cover letter and or teaching a research statement, it's not written well, well, they'll figure, mm, this person probably can't do it on his or her own. The, journal paper was completely rewritten by their advisor because they obviously can't write. And you do not want them to think you can't write because writing is a huge part of the job. You have to write papers, you have to write proposals, you have to write all sorts of things. Um, I would, um, and if you don't have an advisor yet, then you might be able to get an idea of how, and you want to be a faculty member, you can probably find out how that faculty members students have fared in the past and how that how helpful that or not that faculty member has been. I mean, you can find that in the great time, maybe in the room. Um, so I would also say that when you apply, uh, you apply through some awful anonymous website. And I said it's really as as Truman said, it's a bit of a dehumanizing <laughs> uh, so you you know you apply to this thing in the web, um, and you become one of two hundred. So we've talked about some things you can do to get noticed. Well, another thing you can do to get noticed is to send a letter to somebody in the department that your advisor knows, saying, and you have to get your advisor's okay for this. You know, my students send something saying. Steve Marcus suggested that I write to you, and I have applied to your school, and I just want to let you know, and you know, here's what I sent in, because they may not be on the search committee that's doing the narrowing down, but if they're really interested, they can then talk to people who can help. So I would strongly <coughs> encourage uh, doing that kind of thing. And maybe there's a school that you want to apply to, and you haven't seen the ad, and you go to the department's website, and you still don't see anything, you can still send a letter like saying, you know, I'm really interested in your department, Steve Martin suggested I write to you, and, you know, are there any openings, or do you foresee any openings or whatever, and sometimes there are discussions and things still aren't on the website. But making those personal connections through a letter, meeting people at conferences, um, when you go to conferences, if you're interested in a particular school, um, meet somebody from that school. It might be that you go watch them give a talk, and then you go up to them afterwards and introduce yourself, and you have something smart to say about what they said. 
hopefully you have something. <laughs> or get somebody just to introduce you to them. Your advisor, one of the other faculty from who's um, from this department who's at the conference. Um, my students who have gotten jobs recently met the chairs of search committees and or department chairs at a conference, um, sort of as a part of this whole process. And the fact that they knew her face and knew who she was and had a conversation with her, I'm sure helped her get you know, in the door through the first stage to, to get an interview. Um, I would also suggest, I mean, you may not know what this CV is supposed to look like. You can look at websites, but another thing you can do is get examples from people from this department who recently got faculty positions in various places, and or people who, you know, recently got faculty positions here. Uh, you can just ask them. So my students who've gotten faculty positions have been very happy to share their CVs, their teaching statements, their research statements uh, with other people who wanted the faculty positions. So, I mean, one thing that ECD, GSA could do is sort of compile a file of these things. Ask people who got jobs if it's okay, uh, if they'll if they'll share their CV and research and teaching statement to just be shared with other graduate students from here who want to apply. Maybe you know, I wouldn't be surprised if many of them uh, would do that. Okay. Right. <laughs> Right, so, so yes, yeah, so I'm really excited about this part of the talk. If I really just completed this entire process, <laughs> I can contribute a lot here and build on what everybody said as well. Um, so what Andre said and what Steve said um, about going to conferences and networking with people, that's very important. Um, and just going there, I was telling actually my roommate Ken Tao, he's going to his first conference, and I was saying you have to dress professionally, prepare very professionally, and um, this goes in terms of presentations and in writing, like you said. And you want to make you want to make a you know um, an impression on people. Um, so in my experience, I'm a, a good example of this. I met a future person I was going to be working with at, at a conference, and I think I made, did make a good impression of them. And, uh, so that's where I got my faculty position because I had somebody who was fighting for me who had met me at this conference. So that's the first thing I'd like to mention. Um, the second thing I'd like to mention, and again, in submitting these applications and looking for schools, um, the first thing obviously you want to do is have your list of priorities and identify what schools you're most interested in. And then as they mentioned, you can go to the department website. That's a great place to start um, to actually see what open positions are out there, what these people are looking for. They're going to specify what they're looking for. Do they want somebody broad in computer engineering or microelectronics? Or do they want somebody specific who's dealing with manufacturing or dealing with security? That'll all be there. And um, so you can go to these websites, um, and that's a, that's a good way of doing it, uh, to have your list down and to go to these websites. But it's also a very time-consuming process as well. So there are other options, too. You could use these search filters, which help um, academicjobsonline.org. That was one, one place uh, that you could look. There are others as well. Um, there's also this uh, Academic Ease, which sends out emails about job postings, uh, which is also very helpful. And then, of course, you always have your, your faculty uh, in the department and your advisor who may be knowledgeable about some positions that are open as well. Um, the next thing I'd like to mention is, is about deadlines. Um, most of the deadlines are, I see, mostly early December, early January, around that time frame. So you definitely should start preparing. If you want to enter this cycle, you should immediately start preparing right now. Um, but I would even say you should have started earlier. Um, but that doesn't, you know, go without saying that you couldn't still get a faculty position. For example, I didn't start until early November, and I did get a faculty position. So it is possible, but of course you always want to know what, what the options are. You want to prepare the best package possible, get the best reference uh, writers possible. Um, so you should get, definitely get started early. <laughs> um, and another thing I'd like to mention about preparing resumes, preparing teaching and research statements, um, the, best, the best thing is to not be humble at all. <laughs> so, to, so to actually highlight all of your awards, all of these things, and talk about them everywhere, in your teaching statement, in your research statement, in your resume, have them and highlight them. Because a lot of people are you know, going to be looking through a lot of applications, and they may miss something. So you want to have it everywhere, so that it's easy for them to identify and you know, 
best suited your the best candidate. Okay. All right. So a lot of the details have been covered. Uh, I just want to say some uh, only two things. The one thing is related to my uh, green card application. And look, I was trying to apply for green card, and I got this green card form saying, um, uh, because I want to apply for the highest priority, um, the fastest lane, and, and it says, uh, if you want to apply for the fastest lane, uh, you should be a Nobel Prize winner, or <laughs> <laughs> at least, okay. And, and, and I'm not a Nobel Prize winner, but I got my green yes. card. Why? Because, uh, because, because I hired a lawyer to do it. Right? And the lawyer made a case for me that I'm, I'm, I'm good and so that, so that I deserve to be that, that fastest uh, lane. Right? And if you think about this process of applying faculty position, a lot like that. And now you're your own lawyer. You want to make a case for yourself. Okay? And make a case for yourself that you're good. And, and you want to make the search committee's life easy to believe you're good. And you want to make the department chair's life easy uh, to, to believe you're good. Okay, um, everything is centered around this. Uh, of I'm good. Okay, make a case for myself. I'm good. Okay, just convince yourself because I come from the, the Asian culture where bluntless, uh, bluntlessly saying that you are good is considered very rude, and that's in my blood. Okay, no matter how much I try, I can never be as good as some some, some of other people. But I have to try really hard to convince myself I'm not selling myself. I'm selling somebody else. And I'm, I'm telling people how good that somebody else, who made how good Fumi Jones. Uh, <laughs> when I write my, 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 my CV and my teaching statement and my research, I have, to, I have to do that, okay? And I found it's very difficult for me, um, but, but I have to do it. Um, and also, letter of recommendation, same thing. You, you have to have people who say Fumi Jones is good, okay? Can Can should be able to take a depart, uh, position at your department, right? Like, these kind of sentences, but, but they, you know, if you look at recommendation letters, pages, pages, but eventually it boils down to this point, whether this guy thinks you're good or not. Um, so, so and, and also, like, making deadlines and, 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 and preparing your CVs and all that is, 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 is to show people that you're able to make deadlines. So, so if you write an SF proposal, you're able to submit it on time, okay? Uh, and also, uh, if, you, if, you, if, you not, if you make mistakes in your, in your resume and your CV, you're going to make mistakes in your proposal application, you're not going to get the money, okay? And, and all these things have implications. Um, and, and, and I absolutely agree that you have to have insiders in the places you want to go. And that was one of the number one mistakes I had because I was not very good at networking. So even though I know some of the places, I have, we have friends there, my, my advisor has friends here, I never bothered to actually call and to pull the string. And, and that's why I, I failed several times. Um, and I, looking back, if I if I had been kind of pulling some of the strings, um, I, I may get more interviewing opportunities. Okay, so that that was really really important. And also, uh, so far uh, I watched people who get positions, um, different universities, uh, some conferences I I, I met. Uh, I think regardless of what you do, okay, you can make tons of mistakes, and, and a lot of people eventually still ended up in academia. One of the defining feature, one of the common things Paul can share is they are very passionate about what they're doing. They're very passionate about their research. And they take every opportunity to talk about their research uh, to, to people, whoever they met. Okay, being a department chair, graduate student, uh, professor at another university, regardless of whether they got a job or not, they, they got a chance to talk about their research. Um, and, and, and that kind of a quality definitely shows that you're very motivated, you're very driven, uh, self-driven, and, 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 and you can build a program for yourself. So a lot of times I don't even remember who I talked to during, during, the, during the conference and all that. I met a lot of people, and then I talked about my research, and I see other very successful people do the same thing. Like, I, I saw this very established professor, very famous professor, and, and relentlessly talk about what she's doing or, or what he's doing, uh, no matter who's talking about it. You saw this, you open, open your eyes, you just think, this person must be very good, right? And, and all that. So, so I think I think it's always down to a certain kind of quality that 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 you hold, and, and also people are looking in you. And, and let me tell you the dirty secret of hiring. Okay, <laughs> regardless which university you go to, they want to hire big star. Okay, they want to hire the future leader in this field. Okay, um, and 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 they want they, they're looking for the star quality in you. Okay, 
And don't be hesitate to show them your star quality. Don't be hesitate to shine. Okay? And, and if you don't know how to shine, if you already have three years, you still have three years to do that, think about that now. How can I shine when the moment comes? And if this is the year you're gonna do it, if you still don't know how to shine, you're in trouble. <laughs> and, 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 and you you have to talk to your advisor, you have to talk to people around you to get some mentorship to ask the question, how can I shine? I did all these things, okay? How can I shine? Uh, so I think that's that's the thing like I feel um, overall that's 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 what, what people are looking in here, okay? Uh, so so just wanna add a bit of that. Yes, uh, so let me say a lot of stuff has been said, so I have to just a few more things to add, I think. Uh, let me emphasize also what Pumin said, that uh, it, it is very important to be able to, to basically sell your uh, qualifications very uh, articulately, and it's actually more than one reason for it. One is, of course, you want to get noticed, but another thing is actually when you're a professor, Selling your research is a big part of your job. They're, so that when, when they're looking at you, they're evaluating how successful is this person going to be at attracting research funding and being able to support their research program. And this requires uh, you know, being able to convince people that your research is worth supporting and competing with other uh, in a very competitive landscape. So that, uh, that is something that it's not just you know, uh, uh, selling your research or your, your, your record just to get noticed there, but they're actually evaluating you on that as a core part of, of your, uh, what, well, what you need to be doing. And so a few other points. One is uh, when you, your, when you uh, uh, construct your resume or your CV, the re so the research areas tend to be quite important uh, oftentimes. Uh, and I think more and more, uh, especially when, uh, when funding is tight, that, that people like to align, you know, where they hire in terms of where the funding is coming from. Uh, so it's important to consider tailoring your research interests. Of course, always being true to what your what your the true interests are, but just tailoring it properly for the uh, for the schools you're applying to to make, to connect very clearly to where they're hiring. <coughs> so typically, you might have a core like which is signal processing or control, but emphasize the applications or the areas specific areas, specializations that are clearly most important to that school based on the advertisement. Don't just use a generic uh, resume and send it around. And uh, another thing is, of course, there's been a lot of emphasis on the advisor's letter, and that's, that's very <coughs> important, especially if you're higher, if you're, uh, if you haven't done a postdoc, if you're applying right after your PhD, it's absolutely critical. Uh, and, but the other thing is to be careful because the other letters also, one, one lukewarm letter among those can be really fatal. Mm -hmm. And so you have to be careful. And if you have any doubt, a good way, a, a good strategy, I, I think, is if you ask the letter writer, can you write a strong letter for me? Because a lot of people, if you say, can you let, write a letter for me, they'll, they might, they'll be nice and say yes. Uh, but if you ask that question, then they'll be a little bit more open. They might say, well, I don't really know your research or something like that. You know, I can write one, but you know, I, I can't go into a lot of detail. And that's an indication that you know, maybe you, 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 can, you might find another person. So, okay. so I just wanted to, to, to summarize a little bit. I think that this issue of the cover letter, and people have certainly mentioned the cover letter, but the cover letter is a really important tool for you in your application package. To, draw, to, to establish connections to that unit that you're, that you're applying to. To mention any people or connections or even just topical um, or facilities um, synergies between your profile and the profile of that unit. Um, you know, all of the, you should take, right now you should be taking advantage of all the opportunities that you have for meeting people and making these connections through conferences and workshops and meeting with visitors or whatever tools you have at your disposal. When you go to that conference, present yourself professionally, I always ask students if they've got their business cards ready. Because it seems really silly, but you go and you, you know, you talk to someone at a conference, you want to put that card in their hand. You want to put a copy of your paper in their hand. You want to have your name in their mind when you send them that letter two years later that says, by the way, I'm applying to your department. Um, so I, I really liked um, Jeremy's term, getting that extra minute. Right. You want them to, to dwell on your application for that extra minute that causes them to take it from the fat pile to the same pile. Um, so one of the things that I like to say to my students is that the people looking at your application 
are generally a whole lot crankier and a whole lot older than you are. So keep that in mind when you put together your application packet. Um, and you, in that packet, you want to make a case for yourself. Um, I think one of the failings that I've seen in some of this is that that application packet is not making a case for what you've done. It's also making a case for what you can do. Because a, a faculty career is decades. A faculty career is not two years or three years or five years of a PhD. And so the, the packet is establishing what you've done as a, met, as a kind of quality base on which you're also showing them your ideas for what you're going to do in the next five to ten years. And so I think it's really important to have, to think of that packet as a way of showing your potential. Um, and one thing, I think there was some discussion of where to look for um, openings. And one of the things that you may or may not realize is that actually advertising in the public sector is incredibly expensive. And so there are some smaller departments, particularly or smaller churches, where they're not advertised in spectrum um, because it costs like $10,000. That's really crazy. It's really crazy expensive. And so yes, if there are institutions that you're um, interested in, check their websites. Um, and you know, one of the ways that, that I use, and I think is a good tool for Picking the places that you want to apply to is to know the places that you have connections to and be checking their websites. A um, couple things. One of the things that, that Pamela said just made me think of something else. So when she talked about advertising in IEEE Spectrum being really expensive and some smaller schools not advertising them, we haven't really talked about applying to smaller schools. We haven't really talked about, in some sense, the whole discussion has been about applying to universities that are like this one. And depending on your interests, um, there are smaller uh, universities that are mo more focused on teaching, but where you still do research. So there are um, places like uh, Swarthmore, which is one of the top liberal arts colleges in the country, just outside Philadelphia, which also has a really good college of engineering, pretty much focused at the undergraduate level. So it's an extremely high quality place with really good students. And to get tenure there, there still is emphasis on research, but there's much more emphasis on teaching than there is at the research and universities. So, if that's something you're interested in, there's a whole group of schools that don't look like this one exactly, uh, that you might want to consider. And um, uh, Harvey Mudd, uh, Rose Holman Institute of Technology, Swarthmore, um, you know, there's a number of them that are really very good places. Olin College. Uh, hmm? Olin College. Olin College of Engineering, right. So that was one thing I wanted to mention. A couple others. Pamela talked about not just talking about what you've done, but talking about what you want to do in the future. One way to think about this is that the things you write, the letter, the research statement, the teaching statement, are your opportunity to tell your story, basically. I mean, you're writing a narrative that um, you really want to catch the eye of people, that you want, as Poomin said, to kind of express your passion and star quality. And it's not just about being good. It's about also that you are a really good match for this institution. So, um, you know, change your cover letter for each place. I would also change my research and teaching statement for each place. You know, in your teaching statement, you may talk about what courses you want to teach or introduce. That will be different depending on the curriculum, even among ECE departments. And it's going to be hugely different if you apply to an ECE department and a materials science department. So tailor all those things. Really easy to do. Harder when I was doing mine on a typewriter. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you just change two words, and it's a different teaching program. Um, so yeah, so those were the two things. So um, we have about 15 minutes left. Um, I think there's a big topic that we haven't covered, which is the interview process. We've covered it a little bit. I think Puman has a very, um, a very um, glowing, I mean, inspirational thing to say about the interview process. I think what you said was really beautiful. Um, so what I'm going to do now is suppress these guys and ask if there are any questions. Because
because I think your questions are really important. And we can spend any time that's left talking about the interview process, which I think is the main um, poll that we've left in talking about um, the academic job search. So any questions so far? How many universities do you guys apply to? <laughs> and how, I mean, how much time did, did it take? So if you are writing a different cover letter with a different uh, you know, statement for Monmouth University, how long did that really take? I was talking about changing I mean, in little parts. Of little parts, day. not, I mean, un unless it's an ECE department out of business school, okay? But mostly it's kind of tailored. So that's like the five. And at that, at that time, there was no research system in the teaching system. <laughs> 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 that's an application to present a score form would look very different to an application to here. Right. right? right. So right. if you're applying right. to different categories of institutions or different departments, you would absolutely have very different. Right. How many schools did you guys, you two guys, apply to and, and write? I would say you, you certainly want to change the cover letter. The rest, <laughs> <laughs> the rest is debatable, but definitely the cover letter. Um, I applied to something around 10, and then went on two interviews. I applied to something more like 40. <laughs> wow. How long was the process of just writing the It's It takes a long time. Um, and so I, I was applying to a couple different departments. So I had, um, like, you know, a few basic types of research plans, like just wording things differently and kind of emphasizing things differently depending on the type of department. Um, and then there'd be little minor changes for each sort of university, um, trying to incorporate like their facilities, you know, how, and how that might affect the types of research projects that you would do. Um, and it, it takes a lot of time. Um, so. How many of you did you get? Um, about five. Okay, so I applied to about 30 schools myself. Um, and like I said, I gotten started a little bit later than I would have liked to. So I couldn't tailor as much as I wanted to, but um, I did try to pick out the schools that I thought I had the best opportunity, I was the best fit for, and really focus a little bit more on those. Um, uh, so that's definitely the importance of really, of really starting early. Um, and I went on, I had three phone interviews and two in-person visits. So you did that whole thing and then you won. The application part. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Yeah, I mean, I really started, and I only had about a month, month and a half. Um, so I got in touch with my reference writers, started working on my thesis statement. Another thing is I wasn't, I never applied to future faculty program, which would have helped me prepare those things, would be more prepared for the process. So it was, it was definitely tough. Um, but yeah, but like I said, I, I did it, so you could do it, but I would recommend you to have more time to focus a little bit more on this. So I was in, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay. I want to speak to the international students like me. Uh, for me, the process has never been easy uh, because my writing was not perfect. Uh, like exactly what you said, I, I made a lot of mistakes in the first round of publication on my cover letter. Um, it was, you know, it was a, a grand failure, and uh, and I, I had to, I had to do the in, uh, the, the application process for three times uh, before I really get some really nice offers. Um, so I had to. Um, uh, go to an English uh, native speaker who, who criticized my writing and, and helped me a lot in improving the writing. And over the process, I learned how to write better. Um, so, uh, you know, I applied about 30 different schools uh, in, in about two times. In the, in the last two rounds, I, I, I applied about 30 different schools. Um, and it took a lot of time, uh, but unfortunately, it, it's time spread over a three year period. Uh, so, so which through that process to learn a lot, other than just applying for faculty jobs, like writing, communication, presentation skills. Um, I, I was not nearly as good as uh, uh, communicating as, as now, like as, as when I was at that time. Uh, so, so Steve kind of watched my watch my growth right over the years, <laughs> and uh, uh, so, uh, so, so I guess uh, you know had to learn a lot of lessons. Um, but, but, but the beauty the beauty of this process is. It's like a competition. Uh, in, in your everyday life, you make a mistake, you don't get punished right away. Uh, but in this process, you made a mistake, you, you get punished right away. You don't get anything, right? And then the next year, you have to come up uh, stronger and better. 
so 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 that's that's the thing. Um, so uh, the feedback is is pretty obvious and and pretty kind of uh, uh, sometimes even brutal, but but you know you have to. But it makes you better. Um, so so that's how it is. I think I, I'd like to interject a question. Right. This is a question I've already been curious about. So yeah. I've heard many times people on the panel today saying that. If there's an opening, given the cyclic nature, you should go for it. Um, but what if you go for it just before you're ready, and so you're not quite there when you go for it? Is there a chance of going to the same place twice and having a second success? Oh yeah, absolutely. I, actually, actually, I would say the the system don't have a lot of memories, uh, and, and sometimes <laughs> it does. Sometimes it does, but but only if you got an interview, uh, it has memory on you. You got an interview, go there the first time they didn't they didn't give you an offer. The second time you got the same interview, you go there, you better be very much better than the first time. That's when the system starts having memory. Like if you throw in an application, they never even get back to you. Not even a phone interview, they won't remember who you are. So <laughs> absolutely, they got like 200, 200 applications. No no strikes against you. Yeah, no strikes against you. So don't be afraid of of, of uh, start getting some some knowledge out of it. Uh, and also sometimes I feel because I, I'm one, I'm the one who applied several times. I feel actually that might give me a little bit um, advantage because I have to bother my letter writers to write a better letters for me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Last year, your letter didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, so actually, that gives my letter writers some warm up time uh, uh, because you know we're all very busy. Now I'm on the other side, you know, like if someone asks me to write a letter, right, I, and you know, the first time I'm not necessarily putting enough time in it, right, but the second time I say, oh, this guy should get a position, last time my letter might not be Of course, good. if you had three, three papers since last year, that also matters. <laughs> that's, right, that's right, that's right. Yeah, so, so it's a, evol to me, it, was, it has been a very incremental and evolving process, and until at the moment, and I, 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 I think someone asks, when do you feel you're ready, and, and when, when I was applying this for the last round, I feel like I'm ready. I feel like this year I, I, I'm definitely going to get something. Uh, so I, I was that confident then. Because I know I'm, I have learned all these lessons, I have played all these games, and, and then finally I know everything, probably. So, so, so I'm confident now. Uh, and all my other materials are, I feel like, you know, even though I don't feel the letters, I don't see the letters, but I know like after three times writing letters for me, you know, if they still cannot make a case for me, then <laughs> so, 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 yeah. You asked exactly the same question. Right, right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that because that, that's something I was wrong about for a while. I always thought, you know, I had to wait for the, the perfect year, have everything lined up, and, you know, if, if there was a school I really wanted to possibly end up at, the first time they saw me, I wanted that to be, you know, the, the time and to not apply somewhere I really wanted to end up if they were unlikely to hire in my area that year. And I realize now that's almost certainly the, the wrong way to go. You, you should just go for it. And if they're not looking in your area, that that won't preclude them from look, taking a harder look when they are, if that's two years later or whatever. Um, so I just, this just uh, brings uh, a qu interesting question to mind. I mean, uh, many of you have spoken about uh, going for it as soon as you get an opportunity because you never know whether you get a second chance or not. So I mean, in this sort of uh, mindset, if you end up going to some place and you're, you know, later on regret, that it may not be the best uh, fit for you. Do you have the opportunity to uh, go elsewhere, find another position? Uh, is there any, uh, you know, negative? Uh, is there any re repercussions of doing that uh, early in the career if you, you know, jump from one university to some other place? I think, I think the, the answer is simply no. You know, you, you just, it's there, once you get into uh, this, this circle and you start doing things, uh, if, you, if, you, if you feel like this place doesn't work out for you, 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 you have all the freedom to apply to a different place. Okay, and, and no resentment a lot of times. However, the case, uh, I, but, but if you're doing extremely well on the other hand, and then some place are recruiting you, and, and then you made the transition, uh, if you don't handle it well, it may leave a mark, uh, uh, leave some pain in the place that, that, that you abandon. Because it's like they made an investment in you, and you're doing well now that you feel like you're better than this place, and then you move. You know, so that kind of a feeling. There, there, there's going to be resentment there. But if if, if it's like truly it doesn't fit for you, you're suffering, you're not working out, and you find another position, go for it. Okay, because 
yes, we are all, we are all free, right? It's, it's, you know, we can we can we can do that. But but on the other hand, like I think I think probably Steve is a, is a person who, who can give a, a much better advice on how to make a transition without harm the place you actually come from. Yeah. Well, I I would also say that. Even if you're in a place where you think you're absolutely ready and you go to the place you absolutely want to be, you still don't know whether that's really going to be a great fit for you. Usually it is, but you have to go and give it the best shot. And if it's not working out, don't torture yourself. It is okay to look around. I mean, usually it works out, but not always. And there are also personal issues. That come, you know. um, my two of our former students, one mine, one Ray Lou's, uh, were engaged and thousands of miles apart for years, and now they finally both got jobs at Georgia Tech. So they left where they were, and um, you know, so there are also personal reasons people move right. from from one institution to another, and I'm. I'm not as, I mean, you can botch this process, but usually, you know, people who are running departments, everybody knows how this works and that everybody has things in their lives, and that sometimes people move. That's just sort of part of life in that community. Yeah, I'll just mention that practically, I've been here for a while now, and I think that there are some places that don't, I think that our, our department in particular doesn't do a particularly good job of senior hire. Typically, right. when we do senior hires, it's for administrative positions, or there's some administrative task assigned to the position. And so just keeping in mind that there are certain levels at which it's easy to do this at certain kinds of institutions. And it would be helpful if you were thinking about that kind of transition to the University of Maryland to know that you know people like Mike Rockwitz and Ali Reza Kali were able to do it from an assistant professor to assistant professor level just because of the kind of quirks of their institution, essentially. I mean, that it would have been much harder if you yeah. There's, there's something I wanted to point out before, and now we're starting to get away from the topic. Uh, so before we do, is just uh, when it comes to deciding which schools to apply to and trying to focus your energy, especially if you're going to tailor uh, your application from one to the other, uh, that's an area where it might not be clear, but it's still really helpful to contact people to, to try to figure out if these jobs are appropriate or not. And what's on the website is off. It, it varies a lot as far as how accurate it is. Uh, so just two examples to show how it can go in either direction. The job I ended up taking here, when I first saw the announcement on the web, I didn't think it applied to me. I didn't think it covered my area. And it wasn't until I talked to someone that I realized it actually was broader than it sounded and I should apply for it. And obviously, it worked out. And on the other side, um, if you look at Berkeley EE, almost every year they post the same announcement, which basically says, we like smart people or something, something of that nature. Uh, <laughs> But then you, you can, if, if you know someone there, you can talk to them and you know, they'll say, well, that's what it says. But actually, they're almost certainly going to hire in this particular area that's not yours this year, and you can save your energy. Uh, so I, mean, I think what unifies a lot of what's been said here is that I mean, old school methods of communication, calling people on the phone, having a hard copy of your paper ready to hand out, maybe business cards, is still really useful. And maybe even more so because nobody else is doing it. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to say just one thing that has sort of been stirring in my mind as we talked about various things, and that has to do with knowing your audience. I mean, we've talked about tailoring things for a particular department or school or whatever, but it is also important to know what is the audience in terms of who is going to be looking at your application, who is going to be at your job talk. I mean, we're not really have time to talk about uh, research talks, but for example, in this department, there is many years, there's been a faculty search committee that has one faculty member from each area of the department, it's sort of in the standard mode. That way, a lot of places, if it's not a very narrow hire. So that means that a, and double E departments are really broad. We have physicists, we have computer scientists, we have mathematicians, we have electrical engineers, and so, Think of who's going to be reading this. It's not just people in your narrow area. So when you write the cover letter, the research statement, etc., think more broadly than your narrow research area. And when you give a talk, give a talk, try to give a talk 
that can be broadly understood by people across a double E department. I mean, I gave, so I applied to, I don't know, 20 places, got one job interview, um, and gave what was the absolutely most applied talk I could give. And I was told it was the most theoretical talk <laughs> in this department. And I got hired, but, um, you know, but it's, it's, it's interesting. I was trying to use examples so that people from other areas of the department would understand at least three of the words I said during the talk. And so it's, it's a difficult balance because you are trying both to convince people in the broad department to hire you, but you're also trying to convince the people in your area that you're really knowledgeable in, the, in your area. So these talks are very difficult to give. And you need to give some of each of those pieces. You know, there's something for everybody in the research statement and in the talk. Uh, question I hope you guys asked has been here. Um, how do you guys handle work life balance and having uh, real lives outside of your know, hours or whatever it takes to do for your research professor to do this? Well, I can hear my kids right behind the door. <laughs> That's just a, uh, yeah. I, th I think it's really important. I mean, you know, I could argue there was less pressure on assistant professors when I was an assistant professor. But, um, and I'll also say that you know, married now to the person I was married to, I was, I was married to in those days, and I thought I was spending huge amounts of time with her, and she thought I was spending hardly any time with her. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I worked hard, and I also kind of relaxed hard. I was part owner of a boat on a lake. And I would work, there we go. <laughs> I would work all day long and then drive five minutes to where this boat was and go water skiing for two hours in the evening during the summer. Because, I mean, you need to be taking care of yourself. You're not going to be able to do this job. You know, if you totally run yourself into the ground, you're not going to be able to do it. And, um, you know, Mike has a daughter. Pamela brought her daughter to faculty meetings uh, when she was an assistant professor. Um, it would be interesting to hear people who more recently have been to <laughs> about, because I, I think there probably is more pressure now than there was 10 years ago. Well, I can share one word of wisdom with you, which, which has been very effective on me when I was interviewing for a faculty position in Vision. I didn't get that one, but you know, I, I met with a very good faculty member who told who, who we talked about this. We talked about you keep your hands on everything, right? And, and, and surprisingly, the wife was, um, you cannot keep everybody happy, therefore keep everybody minimally unhappy. Including <laughs> 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 your wife, your, your, your family, and all that. So, <laughs> you wanted to hear this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I would say I have been doing this, and sometimes I get into trouble by uh, by 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 the, the word minimum get lost, you know. So if I want to get, get unhappy, then I have to do it to kind of get her back to the threshold. Uh, so, <laughs> well, well, uh, that's that's kind of my reality. Um, after you get tenure, you do feel like you want to shift the balance a little bit. You want to get the epsilon smaller, I think. Uh, but I think that kind of. Is, is one of the common kind of thing uh, that's not uncommon, at least uh, I look around. So. <laughs> My husband and I used to have the don't ask, don't tell policy. <laughs> if, if we ever had a communication during the course of a day in which I set up an expectation about what time I would be home, or he asked what time I would be home, and so we set up that expectation, I would show up every single day. So, I could help the don't ask, don't tell policy. He wouldn't ask, and I wouldn't tell. <laughs> What's going on today? And that only works until you have kids. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that, that article was mentioned in the last panel. Oh, no, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't. So there's a, a great, really, maybe three great articles in one written by uh, uh, a woman at Harvard who had two kids pre tenure. Um, so, that's one great part of the article is, is her discussion of that and it, she also writes very honestly about all the things you're expected to do and, and in a way that was really refreshing to touch on how everyone will 
you know, tell you, oh, you should do this and this and this, and it kind of never acknowledge that you have a finite amount of time and that all these things are ultimately going to take away from your you know, research and teaching and your, your, your main objectives. Uh, so I definitely, I, I don't, do you know her name? Uh, it, it went somewhat viral a couple weeks ago. Somebody Actually, might have you can find the link and give it to yeah. one of you yeah, guys. We can do that. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one, one thing that is part of what she said, and I think this is really important, is to figure out how to say no. So, um, and sometimes that is difficult for an assistant professor to do him or herself. So that's why it's really good also to have mentors. So when I'm a mentor for an assistant professor, I tell them, um, if the chair asks you to do something, feel free and um, to discuss it with me. And if we don't think you should do it, I will go tell the chair. I don't think it's a good idea for you to do it, and but I'll do it in a positive way. It's like, okay, so as soon as he gets tenure, we'll put him on the faculty. You know, whatever it is, it's going to take you. And don't feel that you have to review every paper that's sent to you for review. There's all sorts of requests that come in constantly. You get emails constantly. And you have to become really good at setting limits and saying no, especially to things related to service. Or maybe it's, um, you know, try to work with your chair and your mentors to make it so that you don't teach a new course every semester you're an assistant professor. If you teach a course, hopefully you can teach it two or three more times. I mean, there's all sorts of things that can lessen your load, but you're still doing the job. Um, and, you know, you want to get lots of research grants and all this, but at some point, and I had to work with all, we had 14 assistant professors when I was chair, and I would talk to each of them about what the priority should be. For some of them, they already had plenty of money. No matter what the dean says about bringing them millions of dollars, it would have been a really bad use of their time to write more proposals. What they needed to be doing is doing the research and writing the paper. And so it, you know, there are all these demands that in folklore about all the things you should be doing. Somehow prioritizing saying no, and getting some help with that from senior people to be really important. We've got time for us to wrap up. Mm -hmm. Any final questions? So I, just, just out of kind of um, obligation to this uh, structure that we set up, does anyone on the panel want to add anything about the interview process that you think that we've left out, the actual being there and assessing people? <laughs> I, I could add one thing. Um, this isn't directly related to an interview for academ academic position, but I'm starting to interview my own students now, and only one of them that I interviewed was very familiar with my work, very familiar with the department, and said, this is the place I want to be, and this is why. And I was very impressed by that. So I think that if you're interviewing in a department for an academic position, you should be familiar with the people you're going to meet and say the same things. <laughs> One thing, one thing that I'll add, because, um, I mean, I went through this process a number of years ago, but I really felt like that the interview process was, you know, by the time I was done with the interview, interview process, I, I didn't have one PhD defense. I had 150 PhD defenses, because every time you go to an institution, you're spending one or two days in meetings with people for half an hour, an hour at a time, and each one of those meetings is like a PhD defense. You're essentially laying out your research plan for each of those people, and you're going to be just as bright and cheery and enthusiastic about your research plan for each of those 150 PhD defenses. Now, I, I would add that um, uh, it shouldn't just be you who is being examined, because you're also trying to figure out whether you want to go to this institution. So go uh, prepared with a whole list of questions that you want answered. And um, because people will say, do you have any questions? And if you just kind of sit there. <laughs> <laughs> That's not good. So, and, and, you know, figure out who's there. And there may be certain people that you want to ask a particular question. Yeah. Um, and just be 
So basically, just do your homework all around. Do your homework about the department, have a list of questions, eat very, very well. And then there's, there's psychological aspects that you, you still mentioned. To some extent, if you are harder to get, you are more desirable. <laughs> so it's it's you're thinking about how the place is and so on. <laughs> to some extent, it makes you more desirable. Yeah. So, also, don't create any controversy in the interview process. And we do have candidates who show up and wearing jeans and, 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 and very free style and just want to emphasize she's a, she's a, you know, he's a free person and he's good and he's, you know. But that, you know, even though he's good, we all know, but kind of that created controversy. Half of the faculty members turn away because they felt like unsafe. They felt like this person, it might, 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 it might be a little bit unpredictable. Uh, so, so even though eventually I think uh, uh, people still think he's good, probably offered, we made him offer, he didn't end up come. But, but that kind of created controversy. If, if he just had wear a suit like I did, then, then we would have just unanimously agreed on it. Yeah. Right. So, so don't don't try to create controversy in the interview process. When one of my students, who is a woman, uh, was going to go to interview, she asked me what she should wear. I took her down the hall to talk to him. I agree on that. And what I related was my anxiety attack the night before my interview right. here because I didn't know anything about dressing like a woman. <laughs> I had to go shopping for brooches to satisfy that anxiety attack. <laughs> Just to adapt to something someone told me before mine, you can. It's hard, but try to enjoy it and try to think. Well, okay. I, I've got all these really smart people who are, are and I'm going to have their complete attention for you know the entire day. At least you know, try to think of it that way and, and have some fun with it. It's hard when, when in the back of your mind you know what's on the line. But, hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that, that can be helpful for a lot of people. Okay, cool. So thank thank you for sticking it out. I hope you'll join me in thanking the rest of the panelists, my faculty colleagues, who, and alumni. Who <laughs> joined us for this uh, panel? So. Yeah, let me let me add to that. Um, I, I really, people who sit here, a lot of you have been my mentors, and I have asked questions during my job job application process. The time I remember everything you told me, I remember what Steve told me. Thanks for the letter. It does work, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to express my thank you as, a, as, as a people who graduated from here ended up in an academic position. You can do it, okay? And also, with these people, these are very good people, and trust them, get mentoring from them, and you can do it. <laughs>